My name is Nat, and I'm from Workday, so I have a big corporate PowerPoint presentation. I'm here to talk about applications development at Workday and how we're using MPS. But since we're corporate, first I got one of these for you, and that just says, I'm an applications developer, so don't go buying enterprise software or investing in our company based on anything I say here, because it's probably all lies. So, Workday has been around since 2005, and I've been there for most of that time. We built human capital management first, and so companies can keep track of, figure out how many employees they have and how much they pay every different org and all sorts of stuff like that. Then we moved on to other applications like financial management. We even built a student system and stuff like that. So our applications are built as software as a service. We don't let you download it, install it on your server there. And a given server may hold one tenant, one customer tenant if it's a giant customer and runs out of memory, or several if we, we try and do we are a multi-tenant server. Our website lists more than 1,000 customers, and there's a lot more that didn't put on there. Uh, I saw the Siemens people were here. Siemens bought Workday. I guess they haven't gone live yet. I didn't see Bosch on our list. I don't know if any of the rest of you use Workday yet, but, but a lot of big names use Workday, like Samsung or Amazon or besides Siemens. That their customers are talking to me? Oh, okay. I think they talked to some of the customers they like. Anyway, for the most part, customers like our software, according to customer satisfaction surveys. Maybe we only want to ask the happy ones or something. But let's have a quick look and see if my video will play for you. All right, so I'm signing on as Steve Morgan, a bit. Oh, come on, it was working. I've signed on as Steve Morgan, a business user, and he's going to click the related actions thing by his name, and he wants to move to Europe, so he's going to resign. The date defaults for him, and he's picking the reason is too far to commute or something, and but he's not sure yet, so he's going to save it for later and not resign quite yet. He's just thinking about it. So, and and that's what. Customers do. They go on and manage all their users using that UI, and they love it. Good stuff. So our, about our application, we have a bit of Java under the covers that makes all this stuff go. But all the object model, the tasks, and business logic are all defined as application metadata, so not as real code. So Steve filled out a resignation form a second ago, creating an instance of a resignation event class. And other customers would fill out workers, and they're going to fill out compensation plans and stuff like that. Workday application developers use the same UI. They run different tasks, and they fill out different forms, and they're not creating organizations and comp plans. They're creating classes, and methods, and tasks, and all that same developer stuff that any, any application uses. The concepts that they create are themselves instances of other concepts. We got some of that heavy meta stuff going on. The old guard at Workday likes to talk about the class as an instance of the class class, and things like that. Um, the development experience is a bit tricky to describe, unless you're creative, so let's see if the next video will work for you. So here I'm going to sign as a developer and find that task that Steve ran. That task produces a page definition and called an element. This element has fields and subfields on the page. Within the resignation subedit element is the proposed termination date field that defaulted for Steve. He didn't have to pick a date. In the page behind the field, we find a link to the code that calculates that default value. This is an SAC, a conditional select attribute method. Behind this is more methods. It goes down and down and down, page after page, with method after method bits of code. Are you confused yet? This is how Workday application developers read code today. To edit code, you find the little edit task for a given method and fill out the resulting form. Edit. Fill out the form, same thing for creating things like that. The prompts give you suggestions of what you might want to hook up here, but mostly you just search for what you want and put it together. To see if your code works, you go run the little test task and fill in the context. So here we're going to fill out that as of today, the 12th of the month is indeed April 12th. This is how application development works at Workday today. You already saw that move. So this, this is the state of application development. It's a proprietary language, pretty clearly, and it's domain-specific to Workday Development Application Domain or something. We have hundreds of application developers who are clicking through these forms every day, building stuff. Our 
No, our VP says we don't actually have a attrition problem. They, 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 they do it. They, they complain about it a lot, yes, but they don't resign. We call our language espresso because it's coffee or whatever. So there, there's about 40 different types of methods that developers are allowed to con con create. It's highly constrained. Here we have here is a get referenced attribute method. This was used in that demo code that I just went through. So what it does is given a set, so we loop on a set to find the notice period. Notice periods are probably something we let customers configure, like you can design after two weeks or immediate, or you must give a month notice or something. And then the get attribute adjusts the date to adjust the, the, the current date to the date as of specified by the notice period. So there are 50,000 instances of get referenced at attribute method in our system. They can do other things. For example, the accumulation function down there at the bottom, you can specify um, maximum or minimum or count if without the attribute or sum. You can use the, a method like this to sum up all the lines, all the amounts of all the lines on the expense report or something. So there's, there's 50,000 of these, and there's about 630,000, last I checked, total methods in the system, each sort of representing a line of code. So how do we develop this? Well, 12 years ago, we all just signed on to the main master system and we're coding away together. About 50 of us just coding all the time. And then after a month or two, we'd stop and let it settle and fix a bug here and there. And then QA would say it's good. So we took a snapshot of that and delivered it to our customers and they got good stuff. Today, we have hundreds of developers and they're not all working in the same place. That didn't scale eventually, So, but they all they all develop in virtual servers, which we call single user version or SUVs, so they export utility vehicles or something. So these are virtual servers that we borrow from Amazon and the whole application is on them. Developers produce a little bug fix or a feature as a patch, then send it into some automation that runs through and tests it all for a while and eventually applies it to the master server. Then again, we take a snapshot of the master server and give it to all our customers. We do that weekly now instead of month monthly and tests keep it constantly stable. Our source has no source control other than periodic backups. Only a couple times, way long ago, did we have to restore the database because somebody screwed it up really badly. In, in the last month, though, we've introduced a new patch repository thing. So if I'm working on my virtual server today, now I can push my patch up to the repository and tomorrow get a new SUV and pull my patch down there and keep doing. This is massive progress. So, and in case it wasn't obvious from the demo, Expresso is difficult to learn. We hire new people and then, yeah, you don't get to code yet. First, you get a six-week boot, boot camp to figure out how to do this stuff. And then we let them on there. It takes them maybe three months or so before they feel comf they, they, before they start to get it. But eventually, you, you can code pretty well on this. I spent 10 years doing this stuff, so. <laughs> and, and it worked pretty well for me. But we, you can, there's lots of room for improvement here. We've set out to improve the application's development experience at Workday with MPS at the core. So we call it the YP project. And what is YP? The YP project intends to evolve Expresso towards something more familiar, more familiar development experience. We have all that old Expresso code, though, so we're not going to attempt to replace it. It's too late to, all right, we'll just stop and take a couple years off and rewrite the whole application and then we can resume selling. No, we've got a lot of customers to keep going. So the YP project is changing Expresso in a few key ways. So first, today, first we built a runtime. The Expresso that folks write today is the Expresso that runs, is what runs. It's interpre interpreted. That get ref reference attribute method is just interpreted as it runs. It's not compiled to anything. That fairly severely limits the kinds of optimizations that the interpreter can do across all of the things that run as part of a task. So first, we built a new runtime. I think of it as this abstract syntax tree thing I stole from Wikipedia. Now, MPS has the abstract syntax tree stuff going on too. The YP runtime has nodes for all the things that Expresso methods can do, to walk a relationship, to filter down a set, to calculate some numbers. We compile Expresso methods, the whole body of Expresso methods, down to this new runtime representation, and then when the the new runtime interpreter executes. The whole tree is there, and the interpreter can do things faster with less memory or stuff like that is the theory. But importantly for us, a new YP runtime opens up the possibility that, hey, something besides Expresso could perhaps compile down to the same runtime. So that's why I'm here. 
The YP language is just that. It's a new language that compiles down to the same runtime. It's not Scala, or Ruby, or anybody's favorite stuff. It's still proprietary language that still limits folks to the things that work the application developer need to do. And it, it optimizes for those coding patterns, many of which Expresso is good at, filtering down a stat or walking through my worker and my manager and how many organizations and stuff there. It's not Java, but it looks more like a modern programming language and less like a big expense report form. Developers can look at it and have a pretty good idea of what it does. You can read code way easier. And if you know how to code, you can theoretically figure out how to code with some example code, some documentation. You don't need a six-week boot camp to learn how to use this particular syntax. Shouldn't take weeks. And since we're at an MPS conference, it's perhaps obvious that the YP language is MPS DSLs, and the YP IDE is an MPS rich client platform, RCP thing. So version control just works, because it comes for free with MPS. We have a nice test runner in the IDE. All sorts of stuff just comes for free. Thank you, MPS. And besides, thank you, I MPS, and thank you, ITEMIS. Besides writing our own DSLs, we've extended MPS, starting with ITEMIS's grammar cells, because Marcus told us to, and, <laughs> and we do what we're told. That's what we can, so, and, but we've also added a few extensions of our own, often by borrowing people from ITEMIS to help, them, help us build them. Like we have an SUV manager to connect the IDE to the development servers where the existing code is, to deploy new YP code there or import Expresso code back from YP. We have some DSLs to write YP code and some tests to verify old Expresso code. We've got a trace explorer, an interactive console thing. And you know what? D let's just have a look at some of this stuff with another video. So this cool looking parameterized test thing checks some YP code that I wrote against the old Expresso implementation it replaces to see if the results match. And videos, so of course they do. The code is written in our YP language. It powers the Expresso method search that I'll show in a moment, but it didn't quite work the first time I tried to write it. So I used the remote tracer to execute one of our cases on the SUV and collect the output as it runs, and the results are displayed in our trace explorer, which Marcus spoiled the punchline already overlays onto our code and shows you all the cool stuff. So it tells you as it's running what the response is and all that dollar sign stuff is Expresso instance IDs. Each color wraps an expression. So I found the bug and I squashed it and that's why my tests are green. This is a view of an Expresso metamodel class with instances for public, private, and so on, stuff like that. The static function I just imported using that logic is marked as a stub, meaning the implementation is back in Expresso. But I can import the implementation, which is cool. It compiles the Expresso down to the runtime and then decompiles that code back up into YP code. Justin wrote that. I'll rename it, and then I can publish the code back to Expresso. Publish, publish. And this code has an error because the YP minimum function doesn't accept text. It needs members, but I'm a user, so I don't care about errors. I'm just going to publish back there and run. <laughs> and it works because Expresso is way more lenient, and the runtime supports Expresso, so it still works. So we'll have to decide whether what to do about the error in the IDE. So I picked the set, uh, tested, and picked the set of Expresso instances here, public, private, and protected and stuff, and run my YP code to figure out which is the most restrictive, and it's private. Yes, of course, we knew that. Then we have the last bit is the links. The alias link goes back to the MPS via that cool URL handler y'all have there. So. How come next doesn't go next time? So, all right. So anyway, this is way better than the first videos I showed, right? Application development can be fun and easy again. Or it's going to be once we get this rolled out. So after a bit of a learning curve, not a wall, a curve, we're finding it fast and fun to build languages with MPS. To avoid arguments about syntax, we institute a benevolent dictator for life policy who just decides, and then, then we just go build it. So I'll have to go ask our dictator what to do about that minimum of text value stuff. So we can write the so we can now write the read part of workday business applications in YP and run them as part of the application. What we can't quite do yet is depend on the whole body of Expresso running with the new Expresso runtime, as it doesn't quite match the existing Expresso runtime. Expresso running with the YP runtime doesn't match the Expresso runtime. 
Our new runtime, it's not almost correct. Our new runtime is correct, but it's correct differently. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For an example, picking, a, picking an instance from an unordered set, here the bottom is a, oh, I have this thing where I can do this, right? I, this is a plural set, and then I cast it to, si oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and then I cast it to singular right there. In the YP IDE, we will do this. So casting a plural set to a singular, these are unordered sets, it just picks one. But in Expresso, it always picks the same one, the default hash mat implementation or something. In YP, it also picks one, but it picks a different one. So they're unordered, that's not a problem, but the problem is we have some tests that they wrote because it always returned that, that's what they put in our test. So there's some tests that rely on this bad behavior. Maybe there's some code that relies on this bad behavior. There shouldn't be. So, so this is, these are the kinds of problems that we're working through right now. So we're going to roll out these solutions carefully. We think that the whole end of year financial closing reports don't depend on existing problematic behavior like this, but we've got to be certain before we can roll it out. So, also that YP runtime we built, that was just for Expresso read logic. That's the vast majority of our application, yes, but not everything. So, in case, in this case, the, the make it work part, you, you define the language in MPS and then you have to make it work, so we just compile down to that existing runtime and then it works. In other cases, for example, when we build YP update logic, we also have to define the target to compile down to and the runtime or interpreter to make that work. We haven't used the MPS generator for this. We instead have some Java thing that transforms the language, the language AST to our runtime AST, but it works. So this, the, the, the make it work part is starting to take a little bit longer than the write the language stuff because writing languages is fun and easy, but it's not significantly harder. We're, we're getting through that stuff. We're writing our DSLs and making it work. The most difficult part for Workday is proving to be the whole fitted in with our existing architecture stuff. Our DSLs are fairly stable, but sometimes we improve or adjust them. We added a new switch statement the other day. We ought to keep up with new versions of MPS because we're on 2017.2, we've got to get to, you know, uh, 20818 is coming soon, so we incorporate them from time to time. The runtime, our runtime format, we keep improving it. We recently introduced a compilation format to try to stabilize it a little bit. And all this is just fine for the active YP user who updates their IDE, pulls out their code, migrates their code, and commits it back and keeps up with the world. But some folks go on vacation, like me, or they go work on other things. What do we do about code that was last modified a few weeks ago, modified using a weeks old IDE, using weeks old language, plugins tested, resulting in a weeks old artifa artifact tested against a week weeks old application. Perhaps we should have that still work, but that's not the case today. And even if we do make it work, later when we're approaching done, we're finally done twiddling all these things, maybe we, we can be backward compatible. But for how long do we need to be backward compatible? For now, we're thinking of things like maybe triggering recompilation, not just when the developer checks in their code, but maybe when we have a new language ID or we have a new runtime thing. Change it there that starts our CI process that builds new, builds new code and pushes it through. Our ex existing CI stuff runs all the tests the folks write, most of which require the Expresso application, so it needs an SUV. We produce an artifact of compiled YP code, and that has a short shelf life. It gets out of date. So we're going to try to trigger it when a new ID when a new language comes in, but if the new one comes in and we trigger their code again, then well maybe it needs to migrate, so we have to migrate automatically and pull this in and well if this fails because the test there, then what do we do about the old version of the code that was published in there? All these things that artifact is probably no good either. All these things are where we spend our time time today. We're not stuck really, but we're definitely slowed down slowed down on our rollout. But nevertheless, we have slides. Come on, this is my slide is nevertheless we persevere. Yes, it comes back. <laughs> Whatever. We persevere. The runtime for their language compiles. 
All right, thank you. <laughs> but we persevere. The runtime, which our YP language compiles down to, is going to be provably correct some months from now. We've built a hybrid mode for now where, our where the existing Expresso runs with the existing runtime and the YP stuff runs the new runtime, but we're not so sure that the back and forth stuff is a production ready approach. After all, we didn't build it intending to do that. So, to hedge our bets, we're starting with an initial rollout of our unit test feature. Unit tests don't go to production, they just go to our test stuff. And at Workday, YP has been coming soon for way too long now. We've been working for this stuff for a couple years and have been marketing it to everybody for, for the last year pretty heavily that this is the future, this is going to work. So, we need to show some results of this investment. So, at long last, Mid-2018, we're on the cusp of rolling it out, a fancy new IDE for our developers to write unit tests. <laughs> the rest is still coming soon, but it's coming soon. Next. All right, but coming soon is not just lip service. We are very much invested in all this. Besides the internal release of unit tests, we're positioning the YP IDE as our development solution for the Workday Cloud Platform, which opens up the Workday Platform to non-Workday folks, to external users or customers and partners who want to extend our application and write their own stuff. We don't want to build a separate solution for internal and external development, so we're giving our early adopter Cloud Platform customers the YPIDE this summer, not to write tests, but to define their application object model. And our YP reference application is a register your dog to bring it to work with you application. So here's, they're, they're going to be able to do this, write their dog class and add dog name fields and things like that. We have dogs in our offices today, but it's a paper process. You've got to fill out a form to bring your, bring your dog to work. So eventually, cloud platform developers are going to write their business logic and UI in the YP IDE, but for now, they're writing it elsewhere in, I don't know, in JSON somewhere or something like that. But we're working on all that stuff, too. Right now, we're working on that. I showed you a bit of the read code where that works, and we're working on getting that to production, as I keep saying. We're also working on the update logic. The update logic we're working on with a team who's all back there. They live right here in Munich, over by Ospenhof. We've got the first version of the DSL mostly built. This is not a business application example, but it's an example. And we are starting to build the runtime to compile it down and make it work stuff. Related to that, we're also building UI. This is going down in Munich, Munich as well. We have Patrick back there who's working with Sergey, and they're building the first the languages, the DSLs for our UI. Back in California, we have a team who's working on extending our testing language to support update tests of Expresso logic, and then later of our YP updates. To test update logic in Expresso today. There's no test for that. You just write system tests that test the whole application and run through. So these, those tests take a long time to run. Our CI takes hours. So with the new update test, this is going to be a big, big win. And remember those 600,000 Expresso methods I told you about? They're all in every instance of our monolithic application. So as part of the transition to YP, we're breaking this apart. We build languages for services and and we know how to do this. The hard part's going to be untangling our application, but we'll have app development do that. And back on the continuous integration front, we're working on streamlining this con this streamlining the commit process of some Expresso changes with YP tests, because YP tests go through Git and merge one way, and the Expresso things go through the old history and try and do tell them, yeah, you have to do all these things and hope they line up at the same time is not a win. So w we've got a big giant diagram for that. But in summary, without MPS, I don't think we'd be attempting any of this stuff. But with it, this is very clearly starting to work, and we can see that it's going to work. So we're excited for the future of, app work of applications development and Workday. How did I do? 26 minutes, so I went over to my thing a little more. Are there any questions?
so they don't work together yet. We're looking at things where, okay, you, you're, you provision an SUV, you pull in your espresso changes onto that, you write your YP tests on that, in, and commit them, and then the CI knows how to do that same thing, so to test them, and then it commits. You can merge your YP changes to master, and yeah, we're we're there are meetings on that every day to try to figure out how to do that. Right. We we've we've investigated that a little bit. If we would store all the stuff in the same repository and. That's hard, so our ideal world for that is they're not trying to store it in the same, they're trying to, we're going to have everything written in YP rather than trying to move all that, so that, to pull, pull it through. So, but yes, we've considered all those things you're saying. It's real, it's not just screenshot. <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, then you can have your two and a half minutes back or whatever. Yes, Justin. That fabulous tracer that Sergey wrote was because somebody told me tol told us that that was easier than building a debugger. But yes, in Workday today, we have a fabulous tracer where you can mark one of those methods like a GRA and start trace from here and then execute the application and observe the results that come out of there. So yes, the hope is that we can somehow merge those two so that the tracer that comes here and that tracer can be intertwined a little bit because if you can only see half your code executing in both places, it's a harder sell. I guess the, the last point is you guys keep talking about how do the users like the thing and stuff like that. Our users, I've definitely seen, they try to do it and they just type through the red stuff and ignore it. But all of our users are application develop are software developers who in theory have CS degrees. And most importantly, the, the, the thing they're coming from that they've spent years doing is so much worse that <laughs> they're falling on this with cries of joy. I have no adoption worries. <laughs> all right, thanks folks. <laughs>